Today is the dawning of a new day for you, a new season for you. The word says in Isaiah 61, 60 verse 1, Arise, shine, for your light has come. Who's that light? It's Jesus. Your light, my light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon us. Did you know that you are light in the Lord? That's what Ephesians 5 says. Verse 8 says, so let's just welcome Jesus to shine through us, in us, his word, his principles, his life, and unite our hearts together right now in the reverential awe of God. Precious Holy Spirit, we welcome you. You are such a strategist. You are the one that can put together all the pieces of our life and make it so that we can hold the light, the illumination of the glory of the living God. Shine through us, Lord, in a majestic way, in your powerful way, in your life giving, light, illuminating way in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Wow. What a privilege as we continue on to part three of our series called United. This is so exciting, folks. I'm telling you, I'm enjoying this. I'm learning. I hope you're learning something new that you can apply to your life and to God's principles in your life. You know, we talked about this. You can take two atoms of hydrogen activated with one atom of oxygen, and that cohesion is water life-giving, life-producing water. Or how about if we take the corrosive substance iron ore and we mix it and fire it with a little bit of carbon, you have this alloy called steel. It's the greatest building material known to man. Part one and two of this series, United, helped us realize that unity comes in two basic brands. There's the good stuff, the profitable stuff, and there is the bad stuff. Sometimes it even appears good, but it's the bad stuff that leads to death. There's true unity and corrupt, evil unity that's destructive. You and I, we're interested in the good stuff, aren't we? That promotes God's power, God's outcome here on earth. And I've been calling it true unity, but God's word has another term for it. And this is what I want you to see. Look quickly with me at Ephesians 4, verse 13. And just these few words in verse 13 of Ephesians 4, it says the unity of faith. It calls it the unity of faith. Well, Pastor Stephen, what does that have to do with water and steel? Well, who do you think made the hydrogen, the oxygen atom? Who, do, who hid the iron in the earth or made carbon, that substance? You see, when you remove faith in God from the core of unity, then you're left with corruption. If you care more about pleasing your neighbor than pleasing your God, the real God, the true God, then you don't understand unity, the real stuff. The unity of faith is an agreement based not on preferences or opinions, but on God's principle. Your opinion won't save your children. You know that. Your, your opinion won't save your children from sickness, from sin, or from a destiny in hell. Faith in God will do that. Our agreement on God's promises, in spite of our background and traditions, that is, quote, unity in faith. You know, in my experience over the years of ministering to many diverse groups of believers, I found that talking about Jesus, that's what unites us, not talking about our differences. Our differences are important in the body of Christ as we become united, but Christ's blood is what unites us, not our genetics or our bloodlines. They separate us, and trusting in them can destroy our lives. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb, Revelation says, not our nationality or our gender or culture. If the flesh could add to the work of Christ in achieving a new identity, then God would bless hybrid identity, and He doesn't. The book of Galatians totally rips that idea apart. Listen to me. Unity of faith, revival, follows repentance. It follows this beautiful thing called repentance. You see, repentance sets you and me up for unity, cohesion, harmony. Even in marriage, if you really want your marriage to be rock solid and tight, you need to have that beautiful tool at work in your life every day called repentance. And it's not about, see, harmony is not about sameness, but it's the God kind of steel that produces excellent results. Without change, without alignment, without repentance, corruption is inevitable. I like Paul Harvey, the late Paul Harvey. He was that great radio personality philosopher, I call him. And he said this, Rome fell apart 
because within it had decayed and degenerated morally, socially, economically, to where like an angry scorpion, I like this, he said, it turned on itself and died of its own sting. What a powerful picture. Have you ever seen a home, a building, a home with termite infestation? At a distance, everything can look fine, but when you get up close, you see that the support beams of wood that stabilize the house are now porous, rotten. They're almost like honeycomb. Termites like to eat the wood from the inside out. Right now, we don't have to look too hard to see that in society, there has been this serious case of moral termite infestation. The world is desperate to project this sanitized veneer of fake unity, but it's weak, it's rotten, and it's corrupt. Let's remind ourselves right now of how we started off this whole series. Remember, we talked about the story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. The people of the world that in that day, society was all about pursuing a form of unity by building upward. That's how we do it. We try to put something together to look together. Can I just say that again? We try to put something together to look together. They were drawing people inward with a tower upward when God in verse 6 had told them and, and through Genesis 11 had told them, I want you to build out and possess the land around the world. So when we look in verse 6, God saw, it says specifically, God saw that they were one people with one language and with one plan. That was their unity. And God said that that cohesion, this alloy, would make it so that, here's God's words, anything they imagined would be possible to them. Think about that. God himself said their unity, their fusion of being one people, one language, one plan, had no limits and nothing would be impossible to them. And ultimately, because they were outside of God's plan, that nothing impossible would set them up for utter destruction, right? We talked about you can fall from a chair and you'll bruise yourself. You can fall from 20 floors and you'll kill yourself. So yet, with an evil plan, a unity in defiance of God's commandment to possess the whole earth. The leaders of that day were probably afraid of losing power over the communication. So losing power over the people. They didn't want to build out and lose control. So they said, well, let's change it and build up so that we can still maintain control. Just like a group of insecure people at a point of decision, right? Procrastinators unite tomorrow. <laughs> Here's the thing about being united, that fusion of being one, one communication and one plan. It suddenly reveals our God design, our God nature. In Genesis 1.26, God said, let us make mankind in our image. But a few verses later, God says in the next chapter, it's not good or profitable for man to be alone. Now, why did God say that? Because the gift of increase, you see, of more, of multiplication, is expressed through unity, even if it's two or three of us standing on earth. And see, even though Adam at that point was unified with God, he was in fellowship with God, he didn't have anybody standing on earth to be a two or three unified in the plan with. And God said, it's not profitable for Adam to be alone. Matthew 18, verse 19. Pam and I hold on to this verse in our marriage. It's so powerful. It says this. Again, I say to you that if two believers on earth agree, that is, are of one mind and one harmony about anything that they ask within the will of God, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. This is Jesus talking. Your spiritual agreement your true unity actually obligates the hand of God on your behalf. Wow, that's power. That's what Jesus says about the matter of unity. That would, should excite us and that would excite us, but at the same time, it should help convict and convince us that it's time to get serious about being united. We've got to be united, but according to God's principle. There is a great Ethiopian proverb that says this, when spiders unite, they can tie down a lion. What a picture. Martin Luther King Jr. said this. He said, we must learn to live together as brothers or perish together as fools. Mm, powerful. 
So we know, we are convinced that being united is key to life, building to success. The question is, what's the cause? What's the plan? What coalition or unity is right for you and me? Do you know where you belong? What's your destiny? To whom do you belong? The reality of your destiny is your unity in God's family. Oh, I know. You want to hear that again, right? The reality of your destiny is your unity in God's family. That's why I like that song. United, our hope is in the Lord. United, praise forevermore. God has set us free. Indivisible will be. United, trusting in the Lord, we stand. United. Say thank you to my friend Eloy, helping me write that. The problem with people of Genesis 11 is that they wanted to customize their destiny. God called humanity to possess the world, but they wanted to park in a valley and watch the sunsets. <laughs> God has a call on your life. God has a destiny for you, and it's bigger than you can imagine, but it requires you being united in his family, his body of envoys, ambassadors, representing King Jesus, the King of Kings. God the Father has a family. He's got a family name, and it constitutes his house. Many sons and daughters of all backgrounds, creeds, colors, ages, but all one blood, get that, one blood, Jesus DNA. That's why it's so ungodly for us to become so um, polarized by our own human genetics. It's all about the blood of Jesus. The moment I hear someone call themselves a Christian but emphasize their own genetics, I hear warning bells go off. If Jesus is Lord of your life, His bloodline is preeminent. Period. His bloodline is preeminent. We arrive at unity in the body of Christ if and when we address our sinful nature, let go of our original birth and are born again. Being born again means just that, a new identity in Christ Jesus. Seriously though, how can you, how can you go a new direction if you don't repent? Which means to turn, which means to change your way of thinking. You see, you can try to champion your old identity based on your genetics, your accomplishments, your gender, your culture, but you're actually denying the death and the resurrection of Jesus. He died so that you and I can die to ourselves. Jesus was resurrected so that we have legal right to be born again, to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. So why would you hold on to an old identity, a broken identity, a Genesis 11, Babel, Babel, Tower of Babel ID? Why would you do it? Demanding your rights over Jesus' rightness is aborting your destiny, your true identity, and the family of God. You've got a place. We want you in the family of God. Ninia Campbell, she's a novelist, and she once wrote this. She said, identities are like teeth, hard to maintain and easy to lose. But people tend to look at you funny when you're missing one. That's a good picture, right? So everyone is in a scramble to get an identity. But the problem is your destiny is your unity in God's family. And that, my friend, truly is your identity. I know you all remember the story of Cinderella. In the story of Cinderella, destiny arrives on the other side of correction or repentance of identity. Isn't that true? When the prince sees her and knows her as a princess and not as the poor servant girl, despite what she looks like, then and only then does destiny ignite and the powers that be change her into visually into the princess that we know her to be in her heart. Until there is repentance of identity, there can be no unity in the royal family. Jesus called to Peter's destiny by recognizing him as a rock. That's what Jesus called him. And on this rock, I will build my church. In Luke 6, verse 48, Jesus said that listening and acting on his word, on his truth, is like building your house upon a foundation of rock so that when the storms come, your life will stand strong. Well, many people's lives are falling apart because their identity is not built on the rock, God's truth. 
Jesus, the Word. God has already designed your destiny. Isn't that good to know? He is an expert builder. God is an expert architect, engineer, builder, and you've got a place in His family. Turn with me to 1 Peter 2, verse 5. Here's what we get. Come and, like living stones, be yourselves built into a spiritual house, a spiritual family. You are a living stone, a precious life, uniquely of God's design. God wants you united into His house. I want you united into Father God's family and house. He wants you rushing with His family power benefits. He wants you powered with His benefits. He wants you activated in love. A precious little five-year-old girl, she told her mom, she said, Mom, she says, I'm going to marry Justin. Well, mom said, why? The five-year-old said, well, he's, he's really good looking and, and I like his shirt. He's got a nice shirt. Mom goes, well, you know, honey, she goes, looks aren't everything. The little girl, she thinks for a moment, she says, well, mom, he really likes to clean too. Mom pauses for a moment thoughtfully. She goes, well, honey, you need to lock that down. <laughs> you need to lock that in, dear. Still talking about the reality of your destiny in good unity that unity of faith. Part of the biblical art of being united, and it is an art, is knowing who to walk with and whom you should avoid. Oh, Pastor Stephen, as a Christian, I don't avoid anyone. Really? Well, Jesus did, so are you better than Jesus? I just need to know before we go on here. Are you better than Jesus? You see, our culture promotes a we are the world feel good ideology. Let's let's all have a big group hug and then everything will be all right. But see, that's not truth. That's not reality or it's not what the Bible, God who made everything that exists, says. That's not true. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 10, verse 16, he said, look, I'm sending you as sheep among wolves. Therefore, be wise. You need to be wise because there's not just sheep out there. There are wolves. And some of those wolves have very, very sharp teeth. And they are looking just like the enemy in 1 Peter 5. They're looking for whom they can devour. John Lennon had a famous song that um, after he got out of the Beatles, well, maybe it was still with the Beatles, I'm trying to remember. But anyway, John Lennon had this famous song and the lyrics went like this. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for. And no religions too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You may say that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. My friend, that's unconscious oblivion. It's an arrogant assumption that somehow we don't have a sin problem, that there's not a sin disease coursing through our veins that causes us to do wicked things. He's saying that Cain would not have murdered his brother Abel if only there were no countries. Well, you know that's insane. God thought that you and I were worth the dying for. Sometimes things in life have to be so valuable that somebody's got to be willing to lay down their life. Jesus laid down his life for you and me. That's why he came, to destroy the works of the devil. Sometimes things need to be destroyed. Jesus came to destroy the works and the lies and the fabrication and the strategies of the enemy. Proverbs 18 verse 24 says this, The man of many friends, a friend of all the world, will prove himself a bad friend. You don't need any bad friends. That's not going to be good for you. Unity is not some group hug we just hand out randomly, but an order we practice with God's wisdom. It requires repentance, turning to wisdom, and skill. Did you know unity requires skill to really possess it? CEOs get paid a lot of money to guide their company into a unity, out of a silo mentality, into a unity that makes them profitable. Professional sports, did you know they hire coaches for millions of dollars who bring strategic change, repentance, to achieve team unity. History is full of examples of where it's not the, the biggest and the most strongest who win, but those who are the most unified and that unity of faith, that revival of faith. 
I had this um, session about forging steel in one of our master classes on Unity. You can get that on our website. The importance of unique elements forged together in an extreme heat and compression. That's unity. Simple, diverse elements are made into an alloy with amazing strength, flexibility, anti-corrosive qualities, and great possibilities for building towers. It's not just about you and I being fused into the right family, but also it's about us being the right person. Trying to be with the right people is not a substitute for being the right person. Can I just say that one more time? Trying to be with the right people is not a substitute for being the right person. Sometimes people try to pursue that in marriage. They're like, their life's falling apart. They're like, if only I could just marry this person, then my life will be better. Well, life moves from the, from the unseen to the seen realm. If you got crazy on the inside of you, trying to marry somebody that's walking in integrity is not going to fix your crazy. You need to bring that to the foot of the cross and deal with it with the power of Jesus' resurrection life. So, how do we become that right person? How does that happen? Well, we know the Bible says that we're all born in sin and we need to get saved. You ask the right questions. You see, when you're asking, how do I do that? You're asking the right question. Jesus came to help us be, to get our identity. We must let him save us. Not just save us from hell, but save us from ourselves, from our wrong thinking, from our fractures, from our soul brokenness. So the answer is simple. Repent, change your thinking, return, be revived. Look, let's you and I get really honest here. Without true repentance, you can't have true unity. I just mentioned that to make steel, you must heat up elements to an extreme temperature, compress them to an extreme level, then you get a new birth of a new alloy from that unity. But make no mistake, the heat and the fire provoke a change, a repentance, a letting go. You know, the Bible says that God is a burning fire. He's a consuming fire. God, that fire works for your advantage when you're in the family. You can burn up all the corruption in your life, but you've got to present yourself to him. God doesn't just bulldoze into your life. You must present even the fractures in your life so he can cauterize the wounded places in your soul. He is a surgeon. He knows how to do that. So what does the fire do? It makes the element humble, open, willing, surrendered, purified. To repent is to change your thinking, to return. What do we return to? Jesus' cross, the place of victory, God's plan, God's destiny for your life. God has a plan for your life written long before you were even conceived in your mother. He has a plan for you, but it requires a return to the plan. Repentance is that return. And even though it's got a bad taste in so many people's mouth because it's been misused, it's had a wrong tone associated with it. Jesus didn't run around screaming, repent. He announced it as a life-giving, saving opportunity. Look at Mark 1 verse 15. Jesus talking and it's his first sermon. And he says, the kingdom of God is at hand. He says, repent. Have a change of mind, which issues in regret for the past sins and in change of conduct for the better and believe, trust in, rely on, adhere to the good news, the gospel. Oh, he was pointing out an amazing, an amazing eternal opportunity to get into the family of God. So he said, turn, repent, come to me. Isn't that good news? You know, in the Winter Olympics of 1980, there is the famous story of the miracle on ice. It really was, if you hadn't heard about it, it's really about the U.S. hockey team shocking the world by beating the undefeated Russians to win gold. Coach Herb Brooks said this in the locker room speech right before the game. He said this. He said, guys, he said, great moments are born from great opportunity. And he said, that's what you have here tonight, boys. You have a great opportunity. You see, if you saw that movie, they made of this story. It was in the, the early 2000s. It was starring Kurt Russell. And there's this moving part to the story where Coach Brooks 
played by Kurt Russell, intensifies the training to an unbearable physical breaking point. The guys are just, they're, they're on the ice, they're, they're falling apart, they're just, they're, they're collapsing. And to help the guys, he does this, he brings them to an intense heat. It's almost like he's making a steal for the Olympic Games. And he brings them to this breaking point to help the guys, what, let go of their old identities to let go of their silo thinking, of their old mentality, and to mix them and bring them into a united place where they were Team USA, one mind, one plan, one goal of one communication, just bringing them into that unity. Doesn't that sound familiar? Isn't that beautiful? I'm not gonna avoid the issue here. Depression, anxiety, sadness, hopelessness, they're epidemic today. From the poor to the rich, from the young to the old, people are suffering. They're hurting. And I'm, am I saying that the answer is to just be united? No, absolutely not. Because with whom must be answered? If you don't repent, that's the precursor to being unified. If you don't repent, you will take your inner reality, your inner crazy into a union, and it will only multiply Unions have the power to multiply, so you've got to repent first. Lay down all the sin, the sadness at the foot of the cross. You see, that's repenting. Take responsibility and humble yourself by submitting to Jesus' victory. Winston Churchill said this. It's a beautiful quote. He said, when there is no enemy within, the enemies outside cannot hurt you. Society says if we can just make everything right outside, then you'll finally feel right inside. See, that's a lie. It's meant to distract us from our need for repenting from our own sin and iniquity, from our own fractures. If life can be someone, somebody else's fault, then, then you're going to be free and happy and able to move into a unity. Look, if your life is everyone else's fault, then you are completely powerless to be redeemed. You have to be able to employ your own delegated authority. So you have to take responsibility. Jesus came to give us power over the enemy within. Fear destroys from within. Envy kills from within. Anger, hate, jealousy, lust, depression, hopelessness, all those diseases they destroy from within. Repent. Get your mess out and lay it at the feet of Jesus. And then you can be united to stand. You see, we've been trying to fix life by exporting the blame to everyone else. And it hasn't worked, has it? Oh, sure. We may feel better, you know, for a moment. Even if we blast somebody on Facebook for a minute or two, we may feel good for a moment. But you're still the same person, aren't you? Your inner reality is still attracting all the crazy to the shores of your life. You and I, we got to repent. You know why? Because you're needed. We need you. We need you in the family of God. God's making something amazing and you are needed. Look, you are so important. You're needed. The call of God is on your life and it's significant. The reason the devil works so hard to make you feel worthless, unqualified, unfit is because he's terrified of you, of you getting hooked up with the right people, getting unified and living by faith. He's terrified of that. He's terrified of you receiving, growing and giving. He has no defense against that. So just imagine with me for a second. Imagine the enemy with no defense against you when you're standing in, united in faith. James 4 verse 7 even says this, when we humble ourselves, that means getting in the family of God, submitting to God, our leader, and we resist the devil. It says, James 4 7 says that the devil runs from you. He run, when you resist him in faith, he flees, he runs we talked about 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9. Look at it again. Be sober of mind. Be vigilant and cautious at all times. For that enemy of yours, the devil, roams about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, someone out of unity. Verse 9, withstand him. Be firm in faith. Look, I know you want to stand in the spirit of unity right now. You want to be like Coach Brooks' speech. You see a great moment born from a great opportunity here right now, even if it's difficulty, even if it's challenges, 
Even if it's crazy, there's a great moment waiting to be born right here in this great opportunity. And even though the challenges are everywhere, you can be born again, saved. Have every fracture in your soul as you lay it before God, have it cauterized by the heating, healing power of Jesus Christ. Pray this with me. Heavenly Father, I want to stand in the unity of faith. I repent. I change my thinking. Forgive me of all my sins. Jesus, you died on a cross. You rose up from the grave. Right now, I invite you into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. I'm on team Jesus now. Jesus is my coach. Jesus is my savior. He is my life, my focus. Amen. My friend, you just invited Jesus into your life. You just invited Jesus, the great healer, to begin working on the fractures in your soul. You joined Team Jesus. That means you signed up for team practice too. You need to keep studying the playbook and seizing every opportunity. Look, I have more of an in-depth study on unity on our website. Plus, enjoy more practical steps for your life, your marriage, um, your family, your career. It's all under the, the master class on unity. I know it'll be a great blessing to you. But you can go to the Jesus button right now on our website and let us know specifically how can we be praying for you. We want to pray for you.